Good afternoon. I'm Valerie Neal, a space history curator, and we are broadcasting from the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Please join me in welcoming today astronauts Katie Coleman and Mike Fossum. Well, we are thrilled to have you here today and we look forward to having a conversation with you over the course of the next hour. Uh, it's a special privilege always to have astronauts come visit us here in the museum. And today we have two astronauts who have flown two shuttle missions each and have each spent almost six months on the International Space Station. So I think we're going to be in for a wonderful program hearing both about shuttle flights and life aboard the space station. Astronaut Katie Coleman is a local woman. She went to high school here in Fairfax, Virginia, so we consider her kind of one of our own. She flew twice on Columbia in 1995 and 1999, and if I'm not mistaken, your 20th anniversary as an astronaut is coming up next month. 1992? It's true. All right, so 20 years in the astronaut corps already. Um, Katie is a scientist. She's a research chemist with a degree from MIT, uh, a school that not many of us could get into probably. <laughs> and uh, she has served on two science missions on the shuttle and she was both chief scientist on the International Space Station and also chief robotics officer. Now how cool is that to be in charge of robots? Uh, Mike Fossum joined the astronaut corps just a few years later, uh, came in from the Air Force and through NASA, came in a different route. Actually, I should say astronaut Coleman was also in the Air Force and um, he has served as a flight test pilot for F-16s? Mostly F-16s, yeah. uh -huh. as a flight test engineer. Flight yeah. test engineer, so he came through the traditional route uh, for mm -hmm. the astronaut corps of being a test pilot and flight engineer. Uh, he also has been engaged in science on the space station and his two missions were aboard Discovery in 2006, 2009. Uh, we will be receiving Discovery into this museum in mm -hmm. April, so we're really thrilled to have an expert on Discovery with us today. So, I am going to turn the program over to you to talk and show your video and then we'll move into Q&A after that. You bet. Oh, this is exciting, Valerie, to be here. The uh, Air and Space Museum is my favorite museum in the world. I just love this place. I, I can't count the number of times I've been here and brought my family here to, to wander through the exhibits and the halls and see, uh, you know, as, as a you know, younger a, a child and adult to see, you know, the history in here. And in more recent years, I see, you know, airplanes that I've touched back when they were at Edwards or, or doing their flight test or setting their records. And so it's, it's really exciting for me because uh, history really is alive. Uh, it, it's, we're making more history all the time and this is a place for some of the, just for me, the most fascinating. But you know, I love this, uh, the, the airplanes and rockets like, uh, like every kid or every little boy. It feels like home boy. to you, doesn't it? Uh, right, oh yeah, so it does feel like home because I, I, I have, <coughs> you know, they're, they're like old friends. And I think it's an important uh, you know, part of our you know, nation's history, our world's history, to, to see these things, to see them in context, to see them with your own eyes instead of just reading about them. And really that's one of the things that drew me to want to come to the astronaut business was to experience it myself, to see it with my own eyes, to see out of the windows at the earth below, not just looking at pictures and video. And so uh, you know, that's, that's you know, exciting for me, glad to be here. Well, and for, for me, Something that's a little bit different about the museum now than when I was growing up is that now you can come to the museum and you can see women living and working in space, no. whereas that actually was not something when I was a little kid I could see. Right. And so that, that's a big difference and that's what makes this uh, such a wonderful place. I mean, we're, we're really glad that all of you are here today. Um, and at the same time, it's hard for us you know, to touch everyone in the whole world. And, and so it's nice when there's a place like the Air and Space Museum that brings what is amazing work alive to people. Today, what Mike and I are going to talk to, to you about is basically a year on the International Space Station. I launched in December, just a couple days after my 50th birthday. It was a great birthday present. Big <laughs> my, candle. My husband said he was uh, really pleased to uh, arrange for me to 
have a little rocket ride for my birthday. And so I launched in December. I came home at the end of May, and um, Mike was my backup. And then he launched in the middle of June and came home just after Thanksgiving. So we represent literally a year on the ISS. And you're going to see a couple different patches and a couple different um, vehicles. And I just want to kind of help you navigate before we start. So we go we, on the space station, we have six people that live there. And we go up in groups of three. So when I got there in my group of three with an Italian guy and a Russian guy in our little Soyuz, when we arrived, there were already three people there. We knew that. It was not a surprise. And, and so um, Scott Kelly and Sasha Kaleri, Alex Kripochko were up there. And that's why I have this patch, which is Expedition 26. And so together, we formed a crew of six, which was Expedition 26. But then a couple months into the mission, it's their turn to go home. And we're on the station, and then Ron and his two Russian compatriots come up, and we formed Expedition 27. Okay, and then while Ron is <clears throat> while Ron is up there, Mike comes up. You you leave. I leave. Yes. <laughs> gave, gave me a place. She wasn't In ready fact, to come home. He took my room. He took yeah, my did. room on the space station. <laughs> I did. And then I came up, and we began Expedition 28, which sim uh, symbolized by this patch here for the the crew of six at that time. Um, and then in uh, b b b b uh, September, when Ron came home, we began Expedition 29, and I wear that patch right here, and I was the commander of Expedition 29 as we uh, kind of fish finished out the year. So it's a, you know, it's right, e even now as we speak, and they're probably still awake, um, there's six people yes. living on the space station doing that same kind of three and three and and three and three. The other thing you're going to see in the video is, is actually a lot of vehicles going back and forth. Mike and I each launched on the Soyuz from Kazakhstan, um, in, in <coughs> excuse me, in Baikonur in the middle of Kazakhstan, and, and then we landed there as well. But while we were up there, while I was up there, I think we had three Russian supply ships, a Japanese supply ship, and a European supply ship, and two space shuttles. Mm -hmm. And then while Mike was up there, they had one more space shuttle. Another right? space shuttle, right. So you're going to uh, see uh, you know, things coming and going and people coming and going. And uh, we just want to give you a little game plan before we start on the ride. The year in about 14 minutes. Yes, a year on the ISS <laughs> in 14 minutes. <laughs> so here we go. Okay, let's roll it. And we'll <coughs> just, uh, Where are we going to see this? Where is everybody? Uh, it's going to be on that screen. Okay. Yes. Okay. So y'all, you may want to turn around here. But don't despair, because it takes a while to show the patches, so you'll see it. And there's just a little music, don't worry, we're, you're not going to hear stuff the whole time, so it's mostly, you're stuck with us talking. Yeah. <clears throat> so, the place that we stay before launch, we uh, have a tradition, we sign our door, we get blessed by the Russian priest, and we walk out, and uh, I'm actually begging these guys to take short steps and slow ones, but they forget, and we report to the <laughs> Russian commission, and we... They uh, load us up on the rocket, <clears throat> and moments later, we are leaving the planet. It it's a life. big deal for people to leave the planet. Mike, what was launch like for you? I was standing you know, about a mile away and watching the, the, Katie's rocket just shred the night sky. It was uh, it, really close, really amazing. Eight and a half minutes to get to space, two days to rendezvous with the ISS, and then we are living in space. And it's not about floating around, it's about flying. Yeah. So, it's just amazing to be in such a big, giant place where there's, uh, there's experiments, there's all sorts of equipment. It's a, it's a bigger place. It's like eight train cars all put together. And <clears throat> so it's a lot of room, especially when these supply ships come up. You just saw the Japanese supply ship and then just now the European automated transfer vehicle and now the space shuttle with, with our last module for the space station. So they're going to put that module on board. Before they come up, they do sort of a pirouette under us, and they take pictures of us, and we take pictures of them. It's kind of neat to see each other, and at the same time, it's to understand you know, the health of each other's vehicles. And there's the shuttle crew. They're installing all the cables and all the power so that our new module is all plugged into the space station. We actually pick it up out of the payload bay with the robotic arm, and then stick it onto the space station, hook it up, and then the shuttle crew helped us install that. And then their work done, they, they, um, these folks uh, went back into their shuttle and undocked and closed the hatch. And we're left uh, doing a lot of the experiments that they brought up. One of those is Robonaut. And you'll see that uh, Mike got to spend some pretty neat time with Robonaut while he was up there. But now Scott and his crew left. And look at this. This is not animation. That is a real photograph, a movie of the space station. And uh, that was me playing the flute a little bit up there. And now greeting our new crew. So we're Expedition 27. 
Ron and Sasha and Andre are coming on board. We're so excited to share this amazing place with them. Um, we were actually up there during the Japanese tsunami. You can actually see evidence of that from space, and so we made those, uh, those origami uh, white cranes for them. And this is the six of us on the 50th anniversary of human spaceflight. 50 years after April 12, uh, uh, 2011, uh, people first left the planet. Yuri Gagarin was the first human to leave the planet. And there we are, thinking it's normal. I have a family that thinks it's normal to live on the space station. We actually launched from the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from 50 years ago. And it's making possible things like this. The AMS, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, looks at dark energy, dark matter. And we had two Italians on our flight when the shuttle came up, one with me and one on the shuttle. And so because of the two Italians, we uh, were able to, to have a conference with the Pope. That was really a, a great privilege for all of us. And these are just some views of this amazing space station. So we live on the inside there. This is outside where the spacewalks are. But pretty soon it's our time, Dima and Paolo and I, to climb in our Soyuz, undock, and you'll see a Soyuz out here, out, right out here on the, yeah. the, the, the mirror model that y'all have out there, right? Uh, Apollo Soyuz. Apollo, uh, Apollo Soyuz right. out there. And so you can see that same thing. And these pictures are really unusual, and it's the first time we've undocked when a shuttle was present. So Paolo, Dima, and I left in the middle of the night and took these pictures of the space station with the space shuttle attached. And the only pictures you'll ever see of the shuttle attached to the station are the ones that Paolo took when we were undocking and then landing just a few hours later in, uh, in Kazakhstan. And that's us coming in for our soft landing. <laughs> It's not such a soft landing, but it's solid, and you know, the spacecraft is built for it, our seats are built for it, and uh, it was really nice to be home, although I would have stayed a little longer in a minute. So now this is, so we left Ron on the station, Ron and his two compatriots, and the shuttle's crew was still there. Now they just undocked, there's the station, and their view of the space station as they leave, and then Mike Cruz, Mike Fossum's crew is about to come aboard. Yeah, while Katie was, was going through the descent and uh, and, and coming back to Earth, we were going through our final preparations uh, and heading to the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan to, for our own launch and then our docking, which you see here. It's about a 50 hours from the time you launch until the time you get uh, docked and hatches open. It was great to uh, come aboard and see the guys. Ron and I had a long, long standing uh, joke about him having the uh, uh, coffee on for me. And then he gave, I traveled a million miles and he gave me a, a bag of instant coffee. Nobody actually goes for the food, so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, immediately it was time to, uh, to jump in and get to work, uh, working on different systems on the station. We, uh, we're, we're responsible for the, uh, maintaining the systems, upgrading things, fixing them, and preparing for Space Shuttle Atlantis to come up on STS-135, the final Space Shuttle mission. It was pretty amazing to see it come up below us. Uh, we were also ready. Uh, with uh, high-powered cameras to take photographs of its heat shield to make sure it was all okay, and it was. So we greeted them on board. Uh, a couple days later, Ron Garin and I are heading uh, out the door to do the uh, last spacewalk of the space shuttle era as we moved a broken pump module from the outside of the station to the cargo bay of the shuttle to bring it home. And then we installed a, a, a module there. It's a, a, a robotic refueling mission uh, experiment from the space that the space shuttle brought up and is now installed on the outside of the station itself. Uh, that was uh, seven spacewalks total for me. It's a uh, very exhilarating uh, and a little bit scary. <laughs> and they and they Ron and Mike have the most spacewalk time together of any two people I'm understanding. Yep. There We've they are with the folks on the shuttle crew that helped them get out the door and the shuttle crew before they undocked. Bear in mind this is the last flight. Uh, this is the flight of Atlantis. And so it's the last space shuttle that Ron is ringing them, is saying, Space Shuttle Atlantis departing. I, uh, I broke a little rule here and opened a cover on a window to get this picture of the space shuttle as it backed away. <clears throat> I like to think the robot arm is saluting the station. The shuttle's work finally done. The major thing of its, of its era was building the space station. And we would not have the space station we have today without the incredible capability of the space shuttle uh, program. We say that you can't see any borders from space, but this bright colored ribbon on this shot here is actually the, Indo, uh, the uh, India Pakistan border, and it is a lit border where there is a fence between those two countries in those areas. And, you know, in some ways it's sad that we can see borders from space. The world mm -hmm. has changed a lot, and in our view, from 
you know, living up on the space station, it looks like one planet that all of us uh, could live peacefully on. And at the same time, um, it's really, I think, amazing to have a platform that we can look down and understand with compassion that, you know, that life is hard in lots of different places. And as a people of the Earth, we have some very serious problems to solve together. Our job was not looking out the window and taking pictures, but we sure enjoyed doing that when we had the opportunity. Uh, you could see the familiar landforms, of course, Cape Cod there reaching out. See, weather, Hurricane Irene, we saw three major hurricanes while we were up there and, and uh, actually saw the water running off from the east coast after the big one came up this way, all the way up. Seeing the Nile River and the Nile Delta with your own eyes lit up at night was, was phenomenal. After uh, about three and a half months up there with uh, Ronnie, Andre, and Sasha, it was time for them to uh, head home. And it was, uh, it was a great time. We sure enjoyed it. So of course, Ron and I had flown together on STS-124 back in 2008. So we have lived and trained and flown together for five years. It was uh, kind of strange watching them as they, as they backed away. I love this video of going around the Earth. Now, we don't actually go this fast. This is um, kind of time-lapse photography. But it was something that was pioneered by Mike and Ron, where they actually figured out how to take pictures with our cameras, you know, one after the other, to be able to put a video like this together. And look at this. This is Aurora this, the, Borealis, Australis. The Aurora Australis, the Southern Lights. And we see these kind of things, and, and they're so exciting to see. And, you, and, and you're always frustrated by the limitations of cameras. And for me, one of the most exciting parts of the mission was when we figured out how to capture these views so we could bring them here and share them with you today. Look at that moonrise. Watch the reflection. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, yeah. It was just stunning. And you can see these on the internet. Uh, there's yeah. a, the Peter Gabriel video that right now uses the, these sequences. There's uh, Cairo again in the Nile in a different point of view during the daytime. Again, it's faster than what we're used to seeing when we look out our windows, but it, it shows you a little bit about what it feels like to be. Here's Ron's landing. Watch closely. Boom. Boom. <laughs> you know, it looks bad, but we're, <laughs> we're in seats that are actually molded to our backsides exactly. And so um, we actually, that spreads out the force and it, it, we land just fine. Uh, because there was a, a problem in the Russian Soyuz launch rocket uh, on a cargo ship, we, were, we just had three people up there. Well, not counting Robonaut. He's still one on the left. <laughs> Isn't he great? So we just had a crew of three for a couple of months. Uh, Sergei Volkov here and my Japanese crewmate, or our Japanese crewmate, Satoshi Furukawa. That's how you take your weight in space. Here's how you run. A harness and bungee cords to hold you to the treadmill. Taking a shower doesn't make much sense because the water can't find the drain. So we use a little soapy water on a washcloth and you can wash your face without getting your shirt wet. Going to bed at night means climbing into your sleeping bag, which is just tacked to the wall. Doesn't need to be laying down, does it? It's all the same. So working on systems uh, on the station. Working on experiments. I mean, there are just some fascinating things that we get to do. And I will say even eating is an experiment. Uh, except eating onions like they just were. <laughs> I'm glad I was gone. <laughs> that's, that's our window to the world. We call it the cupola. It's a little bubble of cluster of windows on the bottom of the station. This video here shows what happens when we're burning the engine on the station to reboost it. We're going at a constant speed when we let go, the space station is accelerating away from us. It's really cool. Here's Satoshi. He has a love for ba uh, baseball and he's showing us his uh, one-man baseball skills, he can pitch the ball, then he's got to fly faster than the ball to get to the, to get to the plate. We don't have enough for a whole team. Okay, you know. grab the bat, <laughs> batter up, he Woo. swings, he hits, it's a pop fly. <laughs> can he field his own ball? Let's see it. Fair catch, all right. <laughs> Like Katie likes to point out, uh, after she left, we didn't do anything but just mess around and play games. It's not true. They, they got amazing <laughs> experiments done. But, uh, you know, you can't work every single minute of the day, and it's a fascinating place to live and work. Finally, in mid-November, uh, Dan Burbank, uh, Anton, and Anatoly uh, came up. We just had a few days with them on the station to hand over uh, everything we knew. Uh, or do the best we could, and then it's, it's time to uh, hand over. We had a change of command, so Dan Burbank uh, is uh, now the commander of the space station, Expedition 30. 
it was time for us to uh, pack up our very few belongings. You can take just a, uh, about a, a pound and a half or so of, uh, of personal stuff that you can uh, take home. And we uh, uh, un unlock the Soyuz and start backing away from the station. It was uh, neat to kind of catch a glimpse as we backed away. That's us riding home in a meteor. We're really, the, the small dot in the middle of the screen is our capsule. The other two pieces are expendable pieces of the Soyuz that are burning up. We landed just before dawn, kind of our capsule's in the middle of the picture there, and uh, they get us out, and our first conclusion was, gravity really stinks. Absolutely. The, the ship, that's it. That is the whole thing right there that we come home in, and it's all charred. We were watching the uh, incredible plasma ball around it. Uh, a little while later, we have the traditional funny hat ceremony. <laughs> it's a press conference that we yeah. do after launch, because we land in Kazakhstan, they have their own traditions. And so that's it. That's that was one a year. year on the space station in 14 minutes. <laughs> Let me ask our audience, who wants to go? Anybody oh, come out on. there wanting to go to the space station? We have somebody that's already dressed. Yeah, yes, there we go. I okay, see. good. You are <laughs> dressed. It's true. We have a young astronaut in the audience. Uh, well, we are going to start taking some questions in just a moment. Um, I am going to uh, take the prerogative of being on stage to ask the first question, if you don't mind. And I, I apologize to you. I left out your most signal title, which was commander of Expedition 28 on the space station. I was thinking of everything else and forgot to mention that. So each of you in your long tenure in your different flights have done many different jobs. So I'm gonna ask each of you about two of your jobs. And for you, would you talk to us a little bit more about spacewalking? And then would you also tell us how much commanding does a commander do? Not much. <laughs> Of spacewalking, it's uh, it's outrageous. It's uh, it it's um, we train for hundreds of hundreds of hours in the in a pool, a neutral buoyancy laboratory, where they wait us out so we don't sink or float. And you'll learn the choreography because maintaining a safety tether attached to the structures is very important. It's kind of like a leash. It, well, it, kind of like a leash. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, as, you know, a safety line, and, and and we practice this. And the first time I I kind of slid out of the airlock. There's, there's two things. One is, I, I, uh, it was a shock to see the space station suspended in the sky with nothing underneath it. Because I've, I've, all this time in the pool, there's all this iron structure and there's a concrete floor down there and there's scuba divers and none of this stuff, of course, is in space and it's just hanging there. And uh, I mean, just shiny and you know, amazing. And then you look down and you see this very disturbing blue and white ball going by at five miles a second. Yes. It's like, oh, that's, that's a mistake, don't look down. <laughs> uh, but and the, the space station is the size of a football field, right? The station is yeah. the size of a football field. And so you learn how to move around out there and not think about where you are. You just have to get to work uh, and, and const let the training kind of kick in. Um, it's, uh, I'm a little nervous outside, and I th uh, even after seven spacewalks, about you know, 48 hours outside. Um, because, and I think anybody that's not a little bit nervous doesn't belong there. And but you stay outside for the equivalent of a whole work day or a whole school mm -hmm. day. But yeah, uh, do you get to have lunch? No, you, know? you get a good snack right. before you head out the door. Uh, we, we, uh, it's, we're in the suit, it's pretty much a minimum of six and a half hours. And mine have gone as long as seven and a half. Um, and, and so you get a good snack before you go out and you have a drink water bottle. It's a bag that's kind of inside the suit and a, a little bite valve here to, uh, to, you know, get a little water, but it's not as much as you wish you had, that's for sure. So all you youngsters out there, imagine, you know, going to school in the morning, work, work, working all day, no lunch break, no recess, no going down the hall to the <laughs> restroom. You have to just do your work all day long until eight hours are yeah. over. Then you get to come in. Well, so we should, ta we should meal, talk right? about that part because everybody <laughs> thinks about it, right? <laughs> and so, you know, just to be really clear, you know, up on the space station and in the Soyuz, 
And we have, we have bathroom and bathrooms, too. We're a two-bathroom house. <laughs> um, and so, there, you know, there's, there's one at either end of the space station, and, you know, and that works just fine. But when you're in your own little yeah. spaceship in the space suit, then there isn't a bathroom there. And so, you know, we just go back to the basics. It's the most efficient way to do things. And if you need to go, you know you can do that and not get everything all messy because we go prepared and we wear diapers. That's true. <laughs> my, my, my the glamour of space flight. My, They're not my son there, likes however. to tell his friends. No, know, they have mom. a special name. <laughs> uh, what's it? Maximum absorption Maximum garment. absorbency got garment. Yeah. But, you know, I had to call, you know, be, this is before I had kids, and I had to call my sister and go, no, okay, so the things, they, have, they go in the front, or how does that go, Carrie? And <laughs> okay, how about commanding? When you're a commander, how much bossing around do you get to do? Uh, I was very fortunate that the crew it's, it's, it's really more of a collaborative effort. Somebody needs to be the spokesperson, and that's really all that boils down to. Um, you know, it, for, for me, it was, uh, we, we had some challenges. Uh, we were a three-person crew for a while, and that was easy, but we had to, the, the crew that was intended really to join us right after Ron left was not able to. They were delayed by a mm -hmm. couple of months. And so we had to figure out how to get ready to hand them the keys to the, to the shop, the house, the garage, in a couple of, in a, just four days. And uh, that kind of handover normally takes weeks uh, or months, really. We like to have a, you know, a couple of months to help the new guys learn where everything's located. It's kind of like having, right now we have the 30th crew serving on the space station, really the 31st too with uh, Kanyenko's crew that's up there with Dan. And, and this is like, a, like somebody else m literally moving into your house and then after six months, they hand it over the house and the shop and the garage to the next person who manages it for the, mm -hmm. their time. And so it, it evolves over time, there's a lot to do. So our challenge was more trying to figure out how to prepare training videos and get them trained on the ground and working with them on the ground before they got there. And I've actually been continuing to support them almost every week I've gone into Mission Control to talk to them and answer their questions about where I hid the camera cord. They have cord. your cell phone number. I they bet. do have my cell phone number. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, now Katie, uh, you are obviously a trained scientist with a specialty in chemistry, but on the space station, you end up doing experiments for uh, all different kinds of people, uh, different kinds of uh, experiments. So, can you talk to us a little bit about being a scientist in space and what's different? And then your other specialty is controlling the robotic arm that the astronauts are using outside. So. Shed a little light on that. Well, you know, I'll talk about both those things, but I think when you're thinking about maybe being an astronaut, the thing to realize is that all of us are something else first. I happen to be a chemist. Mike happens to be an Air Force uh, pilot and a navigator and all those engineer, things, yeah. engineer. And, uh, um, and so, you know, that's the job we come in with. But then once we join the astronaut corps, we're actually all trained to do almost all the things. And so mm -hmm. Mike could just as easily be talking about either robotics or, and I could be talking about spacewalking. Mm -hmm. um, for the science sure. experiments, uh, you know, I started to joke around that even eating is a science experiment because it's really interesting how things behave up there. And, and that's why we go. I mean, if you have like Mike's bag of instant coffee that he talked about, well, we, it's just like a juice bag that you might have down here, but you poke a straw into it, and our straws have special little fold-over clips so that stuff doesn't just keep, doesn't coming, keep out coming out of the bag, mm -hmm. right? And so if he spilled his coffee, so to speak, it would be that he squeezed it and stuff came out of the straw, and it would make a spear of coffee. And down here on the ground, that would be just like a puddle on the ground because the force of gravity is overwhelming, and up there, where without gravity or without much gravity, we can find out what do liquids really, really want to do. Well, the reason we want to know that is that every single thing that happens down here that involves flow through a pipe, okay? And that means the way the sewer system works, way, the way the food factories work, every food that is made that involves liquids coming together and being added in and mixed around and but shoved down a pipe, making something like your skis and skateboards and fabrics and everything probably that we could even look at in this room was made using flow through some kind of a pipe. So understanding how that really works, the tiny forces turn out to make a really big difference. Oh, flames, melting. Flames, yep. And everything. so combustion, um, I th that's one of my favorite examples mm -hmm. too, is uh, how things burn things burn a little bit differently up there. You know, we don't have a candle flame that looks like that nice little candle flame we think about here on the earth because the 
lighter gases aren't going to be any different than the heavier gases, and so it's not going to be having those things rise, the new fuel rushing in. Down here on the Earth, it's hard to study combustion. It's hard to study pollution because those things are happening all the time really fast, but up in space, because of the weightless environment, those things happen really slowly, and we can measure them as scientists. So we can understand how things burn to make more fuel efficient uh, kinds of, you know, uh, energy, energy use in, in a more fuel, fuel efficient kind of way. Um, and we can, uh, I, I don't know, the, the, the possibilities are really endless. And so science is really fun up there. It's fun down here too, but I'll yeah. tell you, it's really fun up there. And I could go on and on. We have, a, I mean, we do hundreds of experiments uh, up there and we do them every single day. And we also love robotics. I think all of us love to like actually make something happen. And so we're using controls, and then outside, the robotic arm is moving around. And in Paolo's, in my case, we actually got to catch a supply ship. So this is a supply ship from Japan. It, comes, it launches on a rocket, comes up to the space station, flies in formation with us, That's just amazing. about like from here into where you guys are away. And then with the robotic arm, I'm on the controls, and Paolo is calling distances for me. I'm reaching out to then grab that, and then we actually swing it around and stick it onto the space station, open up the hatches, and find our care packages from our families. So, you know, that's robotics, you yeah. know, at work. And, and it translates down here on the ground in that there are new surgeries that can be done robotically because of what we've learned about how robots work. That's part of the purpose of Robonaut up there, mm -hmm. is to understand how, how robots um, can work with people and uh, in, you know, in some of the uses of robotics here on the ground. So that's a long lecture about cool stuff, I think. <laughs> Very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Well, I think we probably have others. people in the audience who have questions of their own they would like to ask. And we would ask that uh, when you have the microphone, if you would just say your first name and where you're from, because we like to know who comes to the museum. Yeah, we've got to have our first one right here. My name is Nikolai, and um, I came, I came from Atlanta, Georgia, and I and I want to be the first astronaut to go into space, and I can speak, read, and write Russian. Didn't you hear the last part? His name is Nikolai from Atlanta, Atlanta. Georgia. Uh -huh. You want to be an astronaut, and you're dressed for the part already. And what was the last part? We didn't quite hear the last part. Um, I want to be the first astronaut kid to go into space. So Nikolai, what would your favorite, what would your favorite part of being in space be? What do you think? Um, I, I want to go on other planets that people haven't been on yet. That, that would be a great thing. And you know, we're going to do this. It takes a little more time than we would like, but Nikolai is the right age. Okay, I thought I right. would be. You, you are so probably going to be too old, and I so, so am I, to be the ones who are going, you know, to leave even low Earth orbit right around our planet, to go to other planets like Mars. You are the right age, but here's your responsibility, and it's why Mike and I are here today, is because you need to be ready. So, in, Nikolai, in school, do you do reading? Yes, me. Writing? Arithmetic? I don't know what that is. Like counting? Do you do counting? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you are already on your way to you're, do some of the things you need to be ready. You're in astronaut training. It's and true. I, it's what and, we do and all at the time. school, I do lots of science and math. Okay. That, that is good. Do you so, clean up your messes? <laughs> it's important to clean up messes in space. <laughs> it's true. And Exercise. so all of you that are Nikolai's age, a little older, a little older than that, you know, we've got a lot of really exciting things to do and, and actually big challenges on our planet as well. And the way to be ready for those is to be in school, to be practicing, to be learning your math and your science, but your reading and your writing. And, and don't forget all those other things too, like you know, being in gym class and art and all those things. But all that learning that you do in school, it's part of being ready. And I think there's some fun things to do. Thanks, Nikolai. Thanks, Nikolai. Thank you, Nikolai. Does anyone else have a question? I'm Jim Ryan from Kensington, Maryland. Um, do you have any idea when Americans will go back into space on an American vehicle and what it will be? The, we, we have ideas. There's a lot of, uh, there's un, there are, is uncertainty about that right now. 
with the retirement of the space shuttle program, uh, you know, we, we do not have a hum an, an American human launch capability. Uh, Katie and I both launched on the Russian rocket, which is almost, it was harder for me to believe was happening than the fact that I was flying into space. Because I imagined growing up that we'd all be flying in space by now. But to fly on a Russian rocket was uh, beyond, uh, beyond dreaming, beyond comprehension. It, there are a number of companies that are working first to get uh, cargo capabilities up to s the space station to augment the, uh, the capabilities we have and there are, there's you know, human derivatives of those. So there, there's a lot of work in uh, a handful of private companies that are working on those right now. It's kind of a race. I, I think we're going to see the next human launch somewhere around five or six years from now. I'm kind of optimistic that they're, they're going to push through and, and come up with the first capability. The, the reason these companies, most of them are involved with, with this, getting, uh, getting astronauts, American astronauts, up to the space station with this rocket, is they want to develop this technology and they want, to, they want to build more of them and fly more of them than NASA needs. So they want to sell you a ticket. And so they are motivated because they think that they can get this cheap enough that, that not, maybe not all of us, but some of us can, uh, can, can buy you know, a ride to space like yeah, that. I think in the meantime, the thing, to keep, the thing to keep in mind is we spent years building our space station. Yeah. We, meaning 16 different countries. The space station is up there right now. There are almost always six people on board. And we used to spend a lot of time building it. But now we're done building, and we are working and doing really amazing and interesting science and engineering projects up there. So the space station is up there. We have a way to space. It is with our Russian partners. Mm -hmm. Mike and I are here to attest to the fact that it works, and you can go back and see your family when you get done. That's pretty and cool. so, you know, and, and that's the place, that space station is the place that we learn some of the things we need to know before we go to Mars, which is how to recycle air and water, how to take care of people and make sure when they land on Mars, they're actually not like, you know, rubber chickens and can't do anything. We're learning all those lessons. And so we, um, you know, we impatiently, we are waiting impatiently for that American capability to go back to space. But in the meantime, the program is alive and well. And there is always at least one U.S. citizen on the space station. Yes. Is that right? Yep. Uh, do we have a question there from this a... side of the room? No, All right, here comes one. Hi, um, my name is Valeria. I come from South America, from Chile. And uh, I came with my children a little late to this meeting, so I'm not sure if you mentioned already about the kind of food you have there, if it is so different from the one that we eat usually here. Uh, the, the food up there is, is actually very similar to camping food in a lot of ways. We have a wide variety of foods with the uh, you know, U.S. provided food, Russian provided food. I had a Japanese crewmate, so he flew a, a lot of special you know, mackerel with miso sauce and, and, uh, and things like that. Um, some of it's uh, dehydrated. Uh, add hot water, wait 15 minutes, and you have scrambled eggs. Mm, yum. I uh, say that all of it looks bad, but most of it tastes yeah. okay. It's, uh, but it's, it's you know, heating up a pouch with a pork chop in it, uh, very similar to a, a military MREs or emergency yeah. food. Uh, you know, it, it, parts of it get a little old, but not bad. One thing that's a little odd is uh, bread doesn't work real well in space. When you finish eating that peanut butter sandwich, what's left on the plate? Crumbs. They don't go to the plate in space. They float in the air. They're in your nose. They're in your computers. Uh, and so we use tortillas. We eat a lot of tortillas up there because they work really great. They hold together better. So you just take that pork chop, slap it in a tortilla, add a little salsa, <laughs> and uh, you know, and or you're good to go. Or peanut butter and jelly. Or peanut absolutely. butter and jelly, I'll absolutely. I'm willing to try that. I eat a lot of peanut butter sandwiches, and I didn't miss out on my peanut butter in space. I ate it. Nicolai, try that at home. That will be more training for you. <laughs> See what you, you can eat with tortillas. <laughs> And you each get to choose your own menu, right? There are hundreds of choices, uh, and you well, get to actually, choose you get there, there, is a, there is a standard menu that yeah. repeats every nine days. Mm -hmm. But yours isn't the same as his. Yes, is it is. It? Oh, it yeah, is. Yeah, it is yes, now. It is. At the uh, beginning, there was more, uh, more, uh, more freedom, but because of the way the crews are stacking up, we send a standard thing up, you know, and, and we go for the, the, I mean, frankly, you know, you go for the beefsteak and the, the fajitas. 
faster than you go for the tofu with Hossein sauce. Mm -hmm. Mashed potatoes, macaroni and yeah. cheese. But then we each get to bring up some food that is right. our, you know, our choice or, or whatever and from the main menu and, and then other stuff that's either certified, um, you know, so we, we do get to tailor it a little bit. Coffees and teas too, and I was really lucky because Katie's stuff got there late. <laughs> and so I had a, a whole lot of really great coffees that she'd ordered and I hadn't oh. thought about. It's like, oh, bonus. <laughs> <laughs> do you find that you, after a while you're craving for a fresh apple or a fresh tomato or? We get know? apples and tomatoes. They, oh, okay. they come up on the cargo ships. Yeah. And I mean uh, the things that with crumbs, like I, I like cookies, you know, and, and it's that same mm -hmm. bread thing. It's not really all that practical pizza. up there. And so, uh, and pizza. I think all of us were kind of on the pizza hunt. I, I flew with an Italian, so he was always on the pizza hunt. <laughs> <laughs> Down here? Oh, okay, here we have another question. Well, firstly, congratulations on a great expose. My name is Chris. I'm Australian, here on a visit. Uh, my question deals with your mental processes. Uh, really, do you suffer boredom? Do you read? Or are you so busy with your schedules that you are really totally focused mentally for the whole of this particular period? Thank you. Wow. You can well, talk about your food. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, I think we can both answer. I don't, I don't know if I've actually ever been bored in my entire life. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I, I think there's always something to think about. There's always something to, to learn. Um, I do like to read. I didn't choose to take, use my spare time that way on the station. I think a lot of us choose to look out the window. I would say you're busy every single minute of the day, and I myself uh, probably wish I had slept a little bit more. It's not that they don't let you sleep or I couldn't sleep. Yeah. There's just so much to do work-wise and also just personal-wise spending time. You get to talk to your family. You can call them on the phone every single day, certainly once a day if you wanted to. Um, I mean, more than that if you, if you had time, which we don't. Um, so there's time just sharing and, and maybe typing emails to, to sort of tell people what you've been seeing. Mike did a really marvelous job of writing emails that kind of went to a large Thanks. group and keeping in touch with the scouts. Yeah. I, I read a little. I had a, a book on the uh, Shackleton expedition that uh, was a failure as far as getting to the South Pole, but it was a remarkable story of leadership and survival. And we saw uh, one of the, the, the islands that is way down south that's, that I'd never seen before that was uh, Elephant Island. No, it, um, no, South Georgia Island, which was uh, kind of key to that whole story. And we saw that. They, we managed to get photos of that island. I also read a little bit of a, a book called The uh, Closing of the American Frontier, written by John Turner, um, and it, which talked, it, it's the, the book's very old, but it talks about the chain, you know, the, the development of the, of the U.S you know, frontier and that frontier mentality that kind of has shaped who we are as a nation and then the impact, you know, on our, our national psyche when, when we hit the West Coast and, you know, the, there was no more, you know, the, front, the nature of the frontier changed and I thought it was interesting to, to read about that at the same time we're opening up, you know, we're really settling in to another, you know, new area. Uh, I enjoyed photography uh, and figuring out how to capture these views so we could share them with you today. I also am uh, active in the Boy Scouting program. I'm a scoutmaster, and I stayed in touch with all of my boys from space and uh, sent out greetings to scout camps around the country and had some fun doing that. Thank and I read, uh, I read actually just what I would do down here. I read actually books uh, to my son who was down here. Uh, there's a really neat series uh, called Peter and the Star Catchers. And it has, it's, just, it's like about Peter Pan before he was Peter Pan. And I thought it was especially appropriate because when I'm <laughs> flying up there, I really feel like Peter Pan. Like if you think about that, you know, that fairy dust and suddenly you could fly, that's what I felt like up yeah. there. And this series that was written by Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson, it's got, you know, smart girls and smart boys and pirates and fighting and treasure and everything that, uh, everything that anybody under the age of 65 could like. And we saw one scene of you with your musical instruments. Yep, Did I you take actually those for uh, I played. I brought uh, some Irish flutes up there that I think you'll hear a little bit more uh, starting the, this week. Uh, the Chieftains actually used what I played uh, um, in an album that they're just about to release their 50th anniversary album. And so I played those Irish flutes, one of which was 150 years old. So it's kind of this contrast of a brand new space station and a and making music in a way that they've been making it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. Uh, and also played a, a neat duet on my silver flute with, or actually on his silver flute with Ian Anderson of, of Jethro Tull. And I imagine that your crewmates enjoyed having your musical ability. You know, you'll have to check with them about <laughs> that. 
<laughs> I played late at night in the cupola because it had the best view on Earth, so to speak. Oh, yes. And, uh, and it was kind of soundproof. Yeah. Hello, uh, <laughs> my name is Andrew, and I work here at the How Things Fly Gallery, uh, mostly with the kids. And I was wondering uh, what your opinions are on the uh, growth of the private industry into going into space and uh, when the rest of us can uh, maybe hope to maybe be able to go into space as well. I think it, it's exciting. There's, there's a, it, it, it's exciting and it's also unsettling in ways because we're not completely sure how the next chapters are going to play out. There are a lot of really smart people, really motivated companies uh, that are working on this. Uh, they're taking a non-NASA approach to it. Uh, there's good things about that, and there's things about that that, that I don't, you know, that I, I want to look at a little bit more before I decide. But um, I, I think that, you know, we're, we will we'll see, you know, some breakthroughs in different areas, and we've already seen some of those, is they're all taking kind of a different approach to it. And we're going to find ways that work. And, and in the early days of flying airplanes, it was the U.S. government that flew airplanes, and you know, for, for military purposes in the beginning. And then, you know, we built bombers that could fly across oceans, and then we built passenger airplanes that could fly across oceans. And so I think we're, we're, we're seeing that. You know, it's just been 50 years since the, you know, in a few months since the first human launched into space, and what a difference, you know, what, what a changes we have seen. And that took place only 50 years after the first airplane flew. So aviation itself is just over 100 years old, and and so there's been a, you know, an incredible amount of changes, and those changes accelerate, as the technology accelerates, and so we're going to see it. We're going to see it. Do we have one last question? Okay. We got time. Sorry. And then I'll turn it over. We got time. We got time. Hi guys, I'm Whitney. I had a quick question for you. Um, it's a two-parter. I'm here with my colleague Megan, who's actually a student pharmacist from the University of Rhode Island. So I've been bribing her that she needs to become a NASA fellow as quickly as humanly possible to do some uh, studies with you guys. Um, she had a really great question about becoming sick and what happens if on the off chance a strange little virus passes through your uh, gates and gets on the shuttle and what, how you guys handle that when you're up at ISS and it's there. Um, and I had to ask, not everybody can see your boots, but they have a patch on them. And I was curious what the story was. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll answer that first. Uh, I, I'm a Texan and, and so I, I just wear boots all the time. This is a patch, these are some custom boots with a patch from my second shuttle mission. I actually uh, built in, sewed into the boots themselves. It's uh, just for fun. You know, keep in mind that we did a lot of training in Russia. And so, you know, you saw the Soyuz. I mean, so we have Soyuz simulators, and they're just like little Soyuzes, right? And there's a kind of a, like a three-step thing to get up to the platform. The boots in Houston, and you, no big deal. And, yeah, and, and we have simulators in Houston, and you leave your shoes outside often. But, uh, but in, the, in Russia, you always leave your, your shoes outside the simulator, and there'd just be like, you know, shoes, a couple pairs of shoes, two pairs of shoes, and then Mike's boots, cowboy boots. <laughs> and, you know, people would be like t taking pictures of those cowboy <laughs> boots outside the I'd simulator. I'd come out of the simulator, there'd be people <laughs> posing with my boots for pictures. <laughs> That's funny. I guess they yeah. knew when I was in town. <laughs> but the other question was about getting sick up there. Um, first, we, we undergo a quarantine before we go to try not to be sick and not to bring things up to the station with us. And at the same time, you know, they thought ahead. We have every drug imaginable. Um, and we've got directions on board in case we couldn't get a hold of anybody. We almost always could get a hold of someone. And actually, the way we are forced to do medicine in terms of, you know, if we could get hold of someone and get some coaching, and even let's say somebody gets cut or hurt, you know, you'd like a doctor to look at that. Especially, you know, I always say that the only thing scarier than a doctor coming at you a needle, with a needle is a pilot coming at you with a needle, <laughs> right? But, um, but, you know, we don't, even though they're not up here, none of us happen, I guess Satoshi was a doctor on your crew, right. but we didn't happen to have any on our crew. But, you know, we can show our hand or whatever to the camera, and our docs can take a look, and we can all talk about, well, you know, if you were going to lace that up, then you should do some stitches, you know, you should do the pain killing shots here and here and do the stitches this way. And, but we're also trained like that beforehand. Um, and so, you know, we all take, and we take that, that training pretty seriously, even to the, we, oh, yeah. we have uh, defibrillators um, oh, yeah. up there. And I urge all of you to kind of notice when you're walking around some public place and you're in the subway or wherever, I mean, those defibrillators, that's the way people survive heart attacks. And, uh, that, you know, so it was really, it felt very privileged to get trained to do that, and they're not hard to use. They give you all the directions. And so uh, we, we, I think we bring telemedicine a, a ways 
um, by what we're forced to do up there on the space station. Did you talk about quarantine? Keep going. Okay, since we have more time, so we can keep we going. Time, we got some time to do one, sure. one or two more. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, apparently, we do have time for a couple more questions. So, is there anyone else over on this side? We're having fun. We'll get those yes. two. We don't want to go back to work, so you guys yeah. just <laughs> ask away. <laughs> Mary Winstead from Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I um, years ago, my husband and I, uh, we visited uh, the Grand Canyon, and standing there uh, before the Grand Canyon, it just made me feel. Uh, a little insignificant because you know we're, how huge the area is mm -hmm. and I was just wondering what how can you tell can you please tell us how it makes you feel being outside you know of the earth looking down looking back at the earth how it makes you feel you get, oh, I got it how does, does it, it make you feel insignificant also you know that it, it we're, we're humans and yes. and you know I'm, I'm a technical person but I you know try to you know see it you know with you know with an artistic eye also or, uh, for me the vivid uh, uh, memory for me my first flight on the shuttle my job was to jump out of my seat as soon as we got to orbit and unstrap I and mean, the engines cut off and immediately unstrap grab a camera and a camcorder and jump up to the window to get uh, pictures of our fuel tank as it, as it uh, fell away. And, and I've dreamed about this since I was a little kid and worked uh, you know, very hard for a lot of years for the opportunity. And now I'm finally here. And you go through all the emotions of riding you know, on top of four and a half million pounds of explosive propellant. And uh, now you're, you're in space and you're floating. But to jump up to that window and look out at the North Atlantic with the blue ocean down below with a dappling of white clouds spread across the top to see the horizon as a curve with a lot intensely black sky up above even though it's daylight and then see the little thin band of atmosphere about half the thickness of the little finger on the horizon. To see that with my own eyes, not a video, not a picture, but my own eyes was just stunning. And I, I just, I, it, it, it dawned on me, I'm looking at the world like God sees the world from out like, like this, and uh, it was just, I was shocked for a moment, uh, said a quick thanks, and uh, now it's time to get to work. Yes, exactly. exactly. You know, on the, on the lighter side, I flew on my first flight with that other guy from Massachusetts, so Cape Cod. I was glad to be from a place that has such a, you know, very visual, recognizable, you know, geographical feature there. And we looked out the first time that we saw Cape Cod, and he has kind of a Massachusetts accent, and he looks down and he goes, oh my gosh, it looks just like the map. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty neat. I mean, I've been looking yeah. over here at the, the sort of Google Earth thing right. you have over here, yeah. and it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty neat planet we have. Well, and we have um, our oh. view from the shuttle and space station here projected on the wall. And yeah. uh, when, when we don't have these bright lights on for the program, uh -huh. It really makes us feel as if yeah. we're drifting out into space. It's beautiful. We've got time for one more. Okay. Hi, I'm Peter from Kensington, Maryland. I understand the space station will be visible tonight at about 6.15, oh. provided it's not snowing. Could you say something about how often the station comes over and how often you can see it? That's, that's a great question. Part of it depends on, on how far north or south you happen to live. I, I'm embarrassed. I did not know that it was going to be visible this evening. That's a really cool thing to share. If you have not seen it before, go outside. Um, it, the, the, what, the, the time when you can see it is after sunset. You know how sometimes you can see the airliner flying? It's, it's the sun is set here, but you can see maybe even the mountaintops. Uh, not here, obviously, but if you're around mountains, you see that the sun is still shining on the mountaintop, even though in the valleys it's, it's, it, the sun has set. Same thing, we're 220 to 40 miles up. And so when it's dark on the ground, the space station, you know, af just after sunset and just before sunrise, within an hour or two hours, sunrise and sunset, it's, it's visible because it's illuminated, even though you, and so you can see it. And it's really big, and those big solar panels and stuff reflect right. a lot of light. I mean, I, I urge you to uh, go to the internet, maybe find out the exact time. I mean, is it exactly 6.15? Is it exactly 6.15 tonight? I believe it is 6.15 yeah. tonight. It's about 51 degrees altitude, and it'll that's be traveling from southwest to north-northwest. So okay. he just said everything that's important, which when I look mm, at that perfect. chart, to look on the internet, it's on the NASA site, 
you know, you can put in wherever you live and it'll, it'll tell you. And you may think, oh, I'm not the kind of person that can see that kind of thing. It's going to be the brightest star. Given that it's clear out, it's the brightest star and it's going to go over at about this fast. Uh -huh. When he said about 50 degrees, anything over about 30 is going to look like it's up there, and anything like 50 is going to look like it's directly overhead, even though that's actually 90. Yeah. Um, and so it's the thing, it's just going to be a really bright star going about this speed, and there's six people aboard. And no flashing lights. And no flashing that lights, would be an airplane. otherwise it's an airplane. <laughs> but you can see it, and I just urge you, uh, I think it's just pretty neat when we talked about the Grand Canyon and standing on the edge. I feel a little bit like that when I'm standing on the Earth and I look up and I know my friends are at work or on their way to bed yeah. up on the space station. Yeah. Would you two like to make any closing comments? Sure. I'm, I'm, yeah. you, you close. Okay, I'll okay. close. <laughs> I, it, it, I, I hope you do get to see it. It's the, the space station was actually begun, the program was begun about 30 years ago. Um, and it took a long time to get there. There were a lot of twists and turns along the way, some delays along the way. And that 30 years ago, it was a concept. It was a few, a few briefing charts. Um, but it, it, you know, the space shuttle has really fulfilled its you know, final really, really huge mission, the mission for which it was built, hauling big pieces of stuff to space. Um, and, and the space station that we have today, the size of the the modules, the pieces, the internal volume that we have to fly in. I mean, that's because of the space shuttle program, because that big cargo bay had the ability to haul those things. The other parts of the sh station that did not fly up on the shuttle are smaller diameter uh, with, you know, less commensurate, less capability. It's an amazing thing that we've done. Uh, and it, it's a testament to, you know, the dreams and commitment of, of really tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the planet with 15 countries participating in this. Countries that don't have a long history of you know, friendly relations and cooperation, you know, like Russia. Um, but it, you know, it, it really is a testament, though, to, to the human ingenuity and persistence and the, 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 the drive to turn this kind of a dream into a reality. You know, we had personal dreams to participate in the program in some way. And, and each of us has our own story for how we, we managed to you know, persevere and go through school and, and seize on different opportunities to, you know, to prepare ourselves if we ever got the opportunity to do this. And, and we're very blessed in, in so many ways. But, and we, we also take our responsibility in that seriously because we know we're flying for you. But not everybody's going to get the opportunity to do this now. And we, we do our best, you know, to, to make the best of that experience, to get our work done and then find ways to, to share the experience and, and a little bit of the wonder of it, what it's really like. And uh, just to say again, th welcome to the, uh, the Air and Space Museum. It, it's a magical place with uh, stories behind each one of these amazing flying machines through the halls around here. And uh, it's really a, an honor for us to, uh, to be here to be part of this to tell our story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you two have certainly both added to the stories that we can tell here in this gallery and that we'll be able to tell when we have discovery on display. Well, and think about it, you know, each of the little beasts around here that you see these big things, I mean, there's people that that was their life to get yeah. that thing oh, yeah. built and operating. And so there's these kind of stories around every, everything in this museum. So we so appreciate your spending this time this afternoon with us, and we appreciate all of you who came today. Great question. Uh, to the museum and came to this talk. Uh, let's give our astronauts one more round of applause. Thanks. Oops, I guess I'm giving myself a hand. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you.